Okay, so today I'm not going to do a lengthy introduction because it would take too long to, to express all of your accolades and all the ways that I know you. And so I'll save that for the podcast. Um, and so I would like to introduce my good friend, Lauren Regula. And um, why don't we just start by you kind of talking about your childhood, what it was like to be Lauren, and kind of take us through in, in a brief summary of where you are today? Well, I grew up in a teeny tiny small town in British Columbia called Trail. How teeny tiny to uh, small? 7,000 people. And people, you know, say all the time, oh, I grew up in a town of 5,000, but there was a place close by that was big. So we had, we grew up in a town of 7,000 and the closest place that had a hundred thousand or more was three and a half hours away. So there was really nothing around. It was a mountain town. Um, I had one brother and very young parents, uh, which, you know, I don't think was ideal when they first started out, sure. but it ended up you know, being the best thing that could have ever, ever happened to me and my brother. Um, but being in a really small town, there was not that much to do, but it was super active. So we grew up playing every sport possible. We skied in the winter, we swam in the summer. Um, we re really were just allowed to be kids mm. in the fullest form. And um, that ultimately, and the way my parents just allowed us to be and to play has led me down this sporting road mm. that has basically brought my whole life to me. Yeah, for sure. And we're, we'll get into exactly what that sporting role looks like um, today and, and how it's influenced your life. Um, but I, I want to, uh, as we're talking about your your upbringing, I know I've, I've, I've had the opportunity to spend time with your mom and dad, Dave and Kelly, and I know they've had a really big influence on you um, and your brother. Um, and, and for those who don't know, Lauren's brother is uh, Jason Bay, who spent a number of years in Major League Baseball. And so both, you know, Lauren and Jason are extremely accomplished athletes. Um, was your dad, uh, this was a bit of a leading question, but was your dad the one who was pushing you to do everything or was he just the guy who was there whenever you needed him to throw the ball? He was just there. And that's something I tell kids all the time. Um, try everything. The only thing he ever encouraged us to do, I mean, he was very encouraging when we were doing something, but he was never pushy. Neither was my mom. We were always the ones driving the bus. Uh, he always says, you know, uh, he never asked me to go pitch. Uh, when it was softball season, I was always the one like, come on, dad, come on, dad, come on, dad. And there's a story about um, a long, you know, when they were young and Jason was really young, he was sitting there reading a paper and my brother was just flicking the paper. Come on, dad, come on, dad, come on, mm -hmm. dad. It was always us that were excited to play. Uh, part of the reason is they fostered it in a way of, of fun and enjoyment, not work. I never once thought of sports as work. I never once was attempting to do a sport thinking I'm going to, you know, get a scholarship or I'm going to go to the Olympics. So of course, as a kid, you dream, mm -hmm. but we continue to play sports because we truly enjoyed it. And our parents allowed us that type of space to play another sport if we wanted to. Uh, we mm -hmm. were always encouraged and we had to, you know, finish out what we started. But if our heart wasn't in it and we truly didn't like it, then it was on to the next sport. So you didn't, you didn't, uh, uh, specialized in softball at an early age? I didn't even play softball till I was 11. And even then... Think about that for a second, folks. A uh, soon-to-be three-time Olympic athlete didn't pick up the sport until she was 11. Okay, go on. <laughs> right. And um, even in high school, all through high school, I played volleyball in the fall, I played basketball in the winter, and I played softball in the spring and summer. And it wasn't even an option to not you know, it was exciting to be an athlete that played a bunch of different sports because I was ready to pick up the, the softball and the glove when it was softball season. And when it was over, I was so excited to pick up a volleyball. Mm. And there's so many things that translate from sport to sport, right? Um, volleyball, you have to get up and get your vertical. You have to get a lot of power. Basketball, lateral movement. There's so many 
kind of factors that other sports bring. And one of the things I tell athletes today, if I ever go speak to them, is you want to be an athlete. You don't want to be a softball player, basketball player. You want to be an athlete. Yeah, yeah. And so, and I know you and Dave, who, uh, uh, Lauren's husband, Dave, who they own track athletics now, um, you guys have spent a lot of time in this space. You understand, you've read the studies, you've lived it, obviously. But what is some of the, what are some of the misconceptions about um, focusing on one sport that people have today? And what is the, what's the science actually showing you? I get so fired up about this. Um, <laughs> No, all everyone seems to think the more you do it, the better you're going to be. And and to a degree, I understand that thought process, but there's so much emphasis on games really early, practicing all the time, this whole all year round sport. And we have kids now that are 10, 8, and 7. So we're just getting into this whole Mm -hmm. whole mess. And and we'll touch on that later on in the podcast. I really want... uh, people to know how you're raising your kids. I think that's important. Yeah, it's it's very eye-opening. But we, as parents, seem to think that, you know, if we just push and practice more, then all of a sudden our kid's going to be the next LeBron James. When in reality, and studies show, overuse injuries are out of control. When I grew up, I didn't know a lot of, of teammates that had ACL surgeries. I didn't know a lot of teammates that had shoulder problems or... Uh, when they were young, right? When they were 14, 15, that just. Sure. And so that's happening because let's use an example of a softball pitcher. Uh, She's pitching 12 months a year using that one kind of movement versus playing for four or five months and then playing basketball and then playing volleyball and then playing golf or whatever. And so she's giving that particular movement a rest. Absolutely. And she's, um, creating, if you keep doing the same thing over and over, you're creating an imbalance. Uh, And someone might say, oh, but those are the muscles you're going to use for your sport. And I'm going to say, first of all, they're a 14-year-old kid. They need to be a kid. And second of all, that's where overuse injuries come in anyways. So there's a ton of science talking about overuse injuries, but even as equally, um, you know, negative is kids are quitting sports by like 11, 12, 13, 14, they're quitting sports because they're being pushed and it, it's not fun. And that's part of the excitement of putting your glove away and starting a new sport is you're, you're really excited about playing that sport. And you do, you have a new coach and you have new teammates and it breaks up the monotony of doing the same thing all the time. You want to keep it exciting. They're kids. Um, and even as an Olympic athlete, I'll tell you right now, I would never have made it as far as I did if I didn't like the sport enjoying it. Uh, of course, there are going to be hard days, whether you are 14 or 24 trying to make it to an Olympics. Mm-hmm. You, there are going to be tough days, but it's that enjoyment of the sport and what you're doing that are going to keep you going through those tough days as opposed to, it just isn't worth it. I don't even like what I'm doing. Yeah. And I think that's, uh, it's such, I, I don't want that lost in the whole thing is there's like, listen to the kids, see their body language around the sport that they supposedly love. If they're dreading it, maybe mom and dad need to check themselves and listen to the kid, you know? And I think we were, for whatever reason, you know, when we lived in Chicago, like our oldest Jake now is 16, but we didn't play a lot of organized sports because it was, frankly, it was a pain in the ass. And so we played, he would pitch in the, on the sidewalk to us and he played basketball by himself in the backyard because he loved it. And so today he's still playing soccer and um, basketball. He picked up golf. He just stopped playing football, but he's a very active kid. And he thinks maybe soccer is his favorite sport, but he doesn't know. He just loves playing and he loves being around his teammates and he loves his coaches. And and so um, I think we kind of lucked into like being in a really challenging situation in Chicago. And it really helped us just let Jake really kind of guide you know, what, what he was to play and at what intensity and the frequency. Well, and I think if you look a long time ago, it used to be really cool to be a three letter, you know, have three letters, be that athlete that oh, was the jacket. <laughs> yes, yes. Right. That was what people aspired to be. People used to play sports or the way I look at it, I was put into sports to learn life lessons, mm-hmm. learn how to collaborate with other people, mm-hmm. learn how to lose. Mm-hmm. There's all these great life lessons that are learned through sport. And now 
there's more of a feeling of, you know, parents want the best eight-year-old soccer player. Like that's just not really what the avenue I would use sport for. Mm, agree. And you know, and if in what really stands out in my mind about your experience and Jason's experience, um, and I had a, a similar uh, experience with my parents is the way to be supportive of your kids is if they need to play in a softball tournament eight hours away, you drive them there. And that's what your parents did. And it blows my mind the amount of miles they put on the old odometer. But, you know, it was that was the way they supported you. They didn't push you. If you're playing, we're here for you. And, and that's how I, I would argue that's a healthy way to let your kids follow the lead and to support them. And my parents, I played hockey growing up, and that's a, a big time commitment. There's a lot of early practices and cold ice arenas, and it's kind of sucky, you know? And my parents did that like all my teammates' parents did. And so I appreciate deeply what they, the sacrifices they made. And if I wanted to quit hockey, they would have let me. No questions asked. And so, you know, I'm grateful to them for that. But but again, I think in your case, it's so extreme the the amount of um, support they gave you in in realizing your dreams and, and Jason's. And so no, ha hats off. They're absolutely incredible. And the one thing I don't want to ever lose, they did drive me eight hours to play. Uh, that wasn't because they thought it was going to get me a scholarship. We went after I had joined a team that was eight hours away. And uh, I live in trail and I played for a team called the White Rock Renegades because our trail was so small, it didn't have a team. And that was an option for me to play. And they were a, a very, very, very well-respected team. And we, after I'd already agreed and gone, it was because I loved playing so much. They were supportive. But we went down to a tournament and my dad had asked um, a coach. He said, hey, do, do you think um, number you know three over there could play division, division one softball? We had no idea. Mm -hmm. he, you know, there was no, there was, it wasn't premeditated on his part, like, oh my gosh, we're going to get her into a school. She's going to, it wasn't at all. It was, she loves to play. This is an opportunity. We'll go for it. So it, it, it was very pure. His intentions and my yeah. mom's intentions were extremely pure. And I think that's ironic in the whole situation on how both my brother uh, ended up in, you know, major league baseball. And I ended up at a couple of different Olympics. Um, the intention was purely to support their kids in something they truly love to do. Mm, awesome. Awesome. And so, uh, I, I kind of cut you off during your bio, but then you go to Oklahoma State and you're there for four years. And then uh, I'll let you pick up from there. So Oklahoma State is home in my heart. I love it there. Um, good old Stillwater, Oklahoma. Played my four years and um, had a great career there. And I was officially done softball in 2003. And then my first opportunity to even qualify for Olympics was that same year. So there was an Olympic qualifier in 2003 which we qualified. So I played on Team Canada in 2004 um, in the Athens Olympics. And then I had a whole other four-year quad cycle training for the 2008 Olympics in Beijing. And so I was able to basically make softball my job for that length of time, which mm. is crazy. Um, but it was an amazing experience. And you met Dave in that period, your husband. Yeah. So I was playing professionally for the Chicago Bandits in 2005. I've, I, I witnessed a few games. <laughs> Go Bandits. <laughs> and uh, I met I met my husband, Dave, uh, in a bar, yeah. which is perfect. At nightclub. It was, a, it was actually a pretty swanky <laughs> nightclub, which knowing both of you, it's so funny that you would have met there. Oh, can't believe it. And yes, Dave gets very upset when I say bar because he's like, it's not a bar. It's not a bar that you're thinking about. It's a, it's a nicer establishment. For all you Chicagoans, it was Le Passage. Is that right? Yes, yeah. Le Passage. If so you're from Maine, it's The Passage. <laughs> but but yeah, so anyway, that's where you met. Yes. And um, between 2004 and 2008, we met, we got married. So I did one Olympics as Bay, Lauren Bay. I did one Olympics as Lauren Regula. Um, and he was extremely supportive in the whole, the whole year leading up to the Olympics is pretty intense. And so we had gotten married and very quickly I was living, you know, training with the team. So, um, very, very supportive and thankful for him for that. Awesome. Okay. And so, and then I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, but, um, you played 
in the world. So the Olympic uh, softball was no longer part of the Olympics after 08. And then you played in the Worlds. What year was that? So in 2016, um, Team Canada had lost a couple pitchers. Um, one hadn't returned and then one had to actually leave during the world championship. So they were down, um, on their pitching staff. So I got an opportunity as a 35 year old mom of three to come out of retirement and play in the 2016 world championships. And, um, I, I did it and it was the most amazing experience. We took bronze and it just, First, was that the first medal for you? That was the first medal oh, for yeah. me. I was bawling my eyes out. And um, I just can't tell you the difference of having three kids and being a mom and stepping on a field. Mm. You're just in a much different... I was in a much different state. I saw things differently. I processed things differently. I just was a completely different person going through that experience. And I was extremely thankful because you know, we had lost the bronze medal game in 2008. Okay. So we had a bronze within our grasp and we were winning and, you know, we were ahead in the game mm. and we ended up losing. And I had left on an extremely tough note. I mean, I put my glove away and I did not take it out. Softball, that chapter was done. Well, and let's, because I know the story, let's not gloss over that part. Like literally for eight years, you didn't play. No. And then, and how soon before the Worlds were you invited to come back? So I had to be on the field in the beginning of June. And the initial, um, the initial, it was actually via email, was in May. And I let him know in April. So I had taken eight years off, no camps, no clinics, no, literally my life with softball, the chapter had closed and, um, we had kids shortly after. So I was knee deep, you know, and all the kid, kid goodness. Um, and so, yeah, I hadn't done anything. So expectations were low on my end, sure. which took a lot of heat off of, you know, me saying, yes, I had a lot of anxiety over it, but, um, yeah, I hadn't touched a ball for eight years and I had about 10 weeks to get ready. Yeah. And thankfully you, you stay in incredible shape. And so that made that transition easier, but it's still remarkable that you didn't touch a ball for eight years <laughs> and, and still were able to perform. And so we'll get, um, we're going to get into, uh, the upcoming Olympics later, but before we do that, um, I, I think an important part of, of, of your, you know, your kind of bio, your history is, when you and Dave decided to move from Chicago to Akron. And so I want you to share with everyone kind of what that move meant for you. And um, cause it, you know, moving from one city to another doesn't seem like a big deal, but um, I know just cause I know the history and um, Dave's been on the podcast. And so I don't know if his, his will air before this or after, but um, I think it'll be interesting to get both sides of the story here and what everybody was experiencing um, through that. So yeah. please share. We'll see if those stories line up. <laughs> um, so we had three kids and we knew that we didn't want to raise our kids in the city. I grew up, like I said, in a small town in, in British Columbia. He grew up in Akron, Ohio. And I always envisioned our kids, you know, just running, getting grass stains, climbing trees. And that's how I envisioned raising a family and that was something that was really important to us. So um, with our kids, I think at four, three, and one, right around there, you know, our house sold in two days. My husband, Dave, had, we, we had been part owners of Windy City CrossFit. So we had our hand in the gym business for, for a few years at that point. Um, but it was a passion of both of ours. And my husband, Dave, was really intent on, you know, doing, making our life on our terms. And, that's and Dave, and just so everybody knows, um, Dave is, um, well, he's one of my best friends. Dave and I traded together in Chicago for a number of years. And so he was coming out of a career as a trader where if you're familiar with the industry, it, the, it can be a very lucrative business. And, um, Dave and Lauren decided to forego those kind of financial opportunities to start following their heart. And so I don't, I don't want to lose that in this whole story because it is important. Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, we had made the decision. I I trust him, obviously, more than anybody. And I was 100% on board in support of whatever was going to make him happy 
because I knew he wasn't happy. It was very clear. Mm. And I wanted to support anything that he wanted to do. Um, with that being said, I was scared to death. I mean, we were leaving a, a job. We were leaving um, a situation where I knew that our family would be taken care of. We were leaving a situation of comfort in terms of our best friends were there. Do you have... We have the best friends in the world. We yeah. had all of our babies together. There was like 15 of them, you know, six and under, just like all together. We all knew what we were going through. And those those connections are really hard. They're, they can't be replicated because you're never going to go through that situation in life again. And so, um, you know, at the, at the time, I was very um, business-like. And it wasn't until we officially moved and we rented a home because we weren't sure where we wanted to live that I kind of just, I had like a a full on meltdown um, because it was real. It's easy to say, oh, we're going to move. It's like when you get pregnant, right? Like, oh, we're going to have a baby. And then nothing happens for nine months. You know, you see some changes, but your life doesn't change. Mm. And then all of a sudden when it changes, you're like, holy crap, I, I, I'm not, was this a good idea? Um, And then all of these doubts go through your mind because the place we were going to open our gym and fell through there was just a series of events that happened that were very um, unpredictable, and we had no we we had no backup. We had no parachute. Well, well, and also I think one of those events. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to skip over this part. Was how Dave responded to this experience, and so when I think this is important in that. Going through this change, you really had to take on a major role in. I mean, let's let's call it what it was. Dave was he was a mess. You know he he felt viscerally that loss as it was happening before you left Chicago. And um, you know he and I have talked about it. My experience was different, um, not better or worse, because I've I've had to deal with letting go of things much later, things that I was holding on to that I didn't even realize it. And I've had to release those quite recently, six years later, right? And so Dave, um, I mean, he really buckled and was really sad and felt lonely and scared and he felt all the things. And so I think probably the good thing was is you... I, th- I think the reason it took so long for it to maybe impact you is you had to do all the stuff. You had to do all the doing when Dave was feeling all the feels. And so so I think, you know, and again, we don't have to go deep into what that experience was like, but I, I think maybe that contribute contributes to you land an acronym and you're just like, holy fuck, <laughs> what have I done? What have I done? Yeah, so you, that's exactly right. And one thing that we've always, done very well in our relationship is when one's down, the other one's up. You know, you can't Mm. have two people down and you can't have two people up. And and that's been our, our experience and that works well for us. So there was a time I asked him to go get a car seat from our house. And I mean, when I say he was useless, like he was useless. Like he was just blank. He had all the emotions of sadness and no ability to think critically and just put any mo- like wheels in motion. Well, it's fine. Where I come from, we call that being as useless as tits on a bull. So anyway, <laughs> I just have that image. Uh, it, but go ahead. No. So I said, hey, we're at our friends staying over because we had to get out of our house. But I said, hey, you need to go get this car seat. We're missing this car seat. He wanders away. He comes back. And I, I, li- I open the door and I'm all business, right? Because we have stuff to get done. The movers are leaving. I had no time to <laughs> even think or process. Yeah. He opens the door and I go, where's the car seat? And he just goes, <gasps> and then just starts <laughs> bawling. And I literally was like, get in the house. I'll go get the car seat. And he just, he was like a, he was a puddle. We called him puddles. Yeah. You had four uh, kids. He literally. And so, but you're, you're right. I, I had no opportunity. He was yeah. in such a sad and there, there was like this void. It, it was, I didn't see it coming. You know, people say moving's hard. Uh, I I didn't really understand that. And I understood watching him go through that. It was really, really, really a lot harder for him than me because his roots had been there so much longer than mine. Um, but 
it wasn't until we landed and, you know, we had struggles when we landed in terms of also feeling completely lost. Uh, but that's when I had my opportunity. Like we had moved, everything was done. There was really nothing for us to do. All the emotions for me sank in and I was in a state of, um, let's just say it wasn't pretty. <laughs> yeah. And I think this is, is probably a, a, a perfect time to um, segue into something that you and I talked about yesterday, which I've known Lauren intimately since she and Dave have been together. And this was the first time I've heard of this. And so um, if, if you're willing, I'd love for you to share the seven year stretch, which, you know, overlap going from Chicago to Akron and what that experience has been like for you. Yeah. So I actually, it's, it's tough almost to talk about. I'll probably start crying. But um, so as in, as most women, not most, a lot of women that we don't know about experience postpartum depression. And you have this expectation of having children and you just hear all of these romanticized, you know, images and versions of how you're supposed to be as a family. And after our second, so we had three kids in three years, which I don't think was particularly, um, you know, wonderful on my body. I had gotten pregnant within eight to 10 months after having uh, a baby consecutively. So I think that was really tough on me. But um, I, after Jack, who is our second um, child, I had postpartum depression and it was really bad. And I was seeing a psychiatrist in Chicago. I was not feeling well. Um, all of, you know, the images of this perfect family and how you're supposed to love your life and how you're going to love your children more than anything than you've ever loved before. And, and I thought something was wrong with me because I had these feelings that were so dark. And I was scared to say anything because I looked around and no one else had these feelings. No one was sharing that they were having these feelings. To me, everyone had it figured out and there was something wrong with me. And so I, you know, I, I saw a psychiatrist because I knew something was wrong. And I eventually started to feel better. And at about literally like nine or 10 months, I, I kind of felt like a normal human being again. And my husband and I were like, we can do another one. And sure enough, and somehow I, we got pregnant right away and uh, we had our third child in three, almost to the day. So mm. August 14th, 2009, we had our first child. August 17th, 2012, we had our third and then we had one in the middle. So almost to the day, you know, we had three kids, three and under, and that depression came back full force. And again, I'm looking around at all my friends and I'm looking at family and no one had ever really, I've heard of it, but you get all of these forms at the hospital and it's like, how do you feel? Well, I'm not going to put, I'm feeling bad because I'm not supposed to. And so I marked them all good, you know, and then I just went home going, is this normal? Is this, I didn't know it was normal. So there was a huge kind of debate in my head, like, is this what everybody feels like? Or is there something wrong with me? And over the course of, I know yesterday I told you seven years, but I actually have been feeling better over the last year. So I'm going to go with six. Over the course of six years, that depression um, came in waves. And I'm talking like, really, really dark, dark moments of my life where I just, I, I just felt like I couldn't even go on. I mean, I struggled so bad to wake up, get the kids ready for school. Um, and there were moments where I was, I, I always say to Dave, like I've been manageable, but I've never felt good, but I've just been manageable. And when I'm manageable, that's a great state for me. And then there's moments where I, I can't function, completely non-functioning. Like the kids and Dave will see me disappear. I can't, I have to go lay down. I can't even keep my eyes open. I don't want to. Um, and that happened for six years on and off. Um, and again, I was just, I was embarrassed because I thought I was like the only person who felt this way. Um, I didn't talk to Dave much about it because he doesn't want to, I, I didn't want to share how down I was because I don't want to bring his day down where the bird's eye view actually showed, you know, he wasn't stupid. Yeah, <laughs> like sure. He could tell things weren't well. Um, and the move kind of ignited a certain kind of stress and opening a business ignited this stress that I could have never imagined, but already feeling very, um, very depressed and then adding that extra stress 
I just turned me into like a complete tailspin. And um, it's funny because there are a lot of people who do come to our gym track and they'll say, oh yeah, you haven't been around as much. And there there were days where I couldn't function. And um, adding all of that, they say the entrepreneurial life, you know, things are great. And then you're, you know, you're at the rock bottom and then you're on top of the mountain. And I really struggled to to manage those feelings. And um, I mean, it's been a huge process of feeling like a normal person. I mean, it's taken six years. One of the things, thanks for sharing, by the way, one of the things that, you know, we've heard about depression, you know, our entire lives and, and, and have known people who have gone through it. Something you shared with me yesterday that I had never considered was um, getting help as the, you know, getting on the medication or whatever it is, like you don't want to seek it because it becomes like the last resort and if it doesn't work. So can you just kind of, kind of walk us through what that feels like when you're going through it? Yeah. So, um, I knew something was wrong. And if I had a nickel for every time I had said, I, I'm, I'm broken. And those are the exact words. I'm broken something's broken and I don't know how to fix it. And my husband, Dave, would give me ideas. And I was so resistant to the ideas because I was so afraid that if they didn't work, like if there was something I could maybe try in the back of my head, then I thought, okay, maybe there's a chance. But I was so afraid to try. And if it didn't work, I was in, there were times where I was in a really, really dark place I was afraid of what was going to happen. If he said, well, let's go see a therapist. If I did that and it didn't help, then it would reinforce I'm broken. If they said, let's try medication and it didn't help, I was so afraid that nothing would help, that that would just reinforce that I really was broken. And I woke up, the amount of times I woke up just saying, I just, I can't do this. I can't, I just can't do this. I have no interest in living. I have, I didn't understand why people wanted to live. It blew my mind. I would look around and people are, you know, happy and doing things. And I just, it it blew my mind. And, you know, Dave had said to me, how do you know before you even get out of bed? And I just, as soon as the alarm would go off, I would go, nope, I can't do it. I can't, I just, I just, please let me sleep forever. And so I was really afraid that if I did get help, if it didn't work, then I didn't know what I would do at that point. It really felt like, um, like you were saying, it really felt like my last lifeline. And I always wanted to keep that there to let myself know that there's still an option, even though I don't want to use it. Because if I use it and it doesn't work, I'm fucked. Yeah. 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 And that was terrifying. And he could never, Dave could never understand my resistance. Yeah. Well, and I think logically, like, I would have never understood why wouldn't you want to get help? But the way you articulate it, it's like, why would you want to get that help? That's like the one thing that's really arguably keeping you alive. Right. Literally. Like, literally. Frightening, right? Frightening, right. And um, it had finally hit such a bad point. Um, Dave called the therapist for me because I didn't want to. Mm-hmm. Um, and he also called the doctor to get my blood work done. And we, you know, with his help, and what was your reaction? Oh, I had, oh, it was bad. When I found out he called the therapist, I lost it. I lost it. I was so embarrassed. Um, I knew he had to ask a friend for the therapist's name. Small town. And it's a small town. And I, I was so embarrassed. I was so, I was pissed. I was absolutely pissed. I'm like, well, not only now do you know I'm crazy, other people know I'm crazy. And... um to me, no one else was having these feelings. So I thought I was the only person. And, you know, as Dave has said to me, he's like, Lauren, the name I got the therapist from was someone who goes to see her. So, you know, he understands. Yeah. Well done. And, but at the time I, I wasn't, I wasn't open to people knowing I wasn't open to help. I wasn't open to anything. I just wanted to sleep. I just wanted people to leave me alone and just leave me alone. You know, and I think what's important too is I don't want people to get this twisted like Lauren's this um, 
Olympic athlete with a huge ego. And I don't want people to know it has, she's not, you would never know that she's done any of the things she's done. Like you are as authentic and as grounded as, as anyone I know. And so when you say that it's from a very human perspective, like I'm just embarrassed and scared and all those things. And so I, I want people to understand that this comes from a deep part within you. It has nothing to do with what you've accomplished. Now, those things have we talked about made it more challenging maybe to speak up because as you said, who am I to complain? I have all these great things that have happened for me, right? Yeah. And, I, and that's a that's a problem in itself because the negative thought loops that happen and the vicious cycle of feeling guilty over, um, you know, there was nothing wrong. Like I, I, my family was healthy. I mean, I had all of these going through my head and I didn't understand why I wasn't feeling well because I had, like, I was so fortunate and I knew that. So I then felt worse about myself. Mm. And the funny thing is, is, and my husband will be the first to tell you, you know, yes, I made it to the Olympics. And this six year long bout and episode of battling depression was honestly the most humbling. Um, it took away all my self-confidence and the amount of times, you know, me saying I'm broken, though that and Dave would say, Lauren, remember who you are. Those two statements were said in our house so many times because I had lost myself. I, I didn't know who I was. I, I was scared of my own shadow. And that is just not me. You know, I never was cocky by any means, but I did have a quiet confidence. I was always, you know, just confident in myself. And I was literally scared of my own shadow. I couldn't sleep. I worried about what everybody thought. I worried about um, if I didn't do well, the perception of that. I, I, I just, I worried about everything. And um, I mean, I'm talking stomach issues and just the amount of anxiety and stress. I never had an anxiety attack before. And I started having anxiety attacks. And I can't even describe them because- I was going to ask you to. So it's just, I mean, you just completely buckle and- Buckle, lock up breathing really rapidly, heart rate, and just body tingles, feels like you're going to throw up. And really, when I look back on it, there was no external reason. I was creating these, these situations in my head. And um, I know we have talked about this before, but exactly like brain patterns get, you know, kind of woven into your brain, these negative thought loops just, they were constant. And so even when nothing bad was happening to me, that's always where my mind went was to the negative, to the just negative. Ruminate it on was, that. Yep. It was just constant. Yeah. And I think, and again, I think a really important thing you bring up is I think a lot of people maybe don't have the deep depression part, right? But a lot of people who quote unquote have a lot of things going for them have been fortunate, fill in the blank, right? don't feel they have the right to speak out and say, I'm hurting and I need help. It's like, I have all these things. I have all these friends. My kids are healthy. Like, this is just something I need to deal with myself and bury it. And I think, you know, people out there, if you're feeling like you've accomplished a lot and you're grateful it still doesn't mean that you're out of the woods and that you need to deal with all of this stuff yourself. And so I think I'm, I'm glad you shared that because that's important. Well, and one thing, a conversation on the podcast that you had with Dave was men feeling like they have to be a man and they shouldn't have problems that they're coming out with, that they should be the one solving them. And I think from a mother's perspective, you know, as a mother, the expectation is you should have it all figured out. And you, you don't need help because you can do it all. It's your kids. And that's one thing I've learned over this whole uh, block of this time. It's okay to ask for help. And it's okay to say, I am not doing okay. I'm not doing well because the amount of feedback I actually get back in terms of, oh my gosh, you don't feel well? Um, oh my gosh, I didn't either. I thought I was the only one. But there's just not an avenue to make that make that known without feeling awkward. And so I think, you know, the, the man has the, you know, I, I need to be a man and I need to bury it. And the mom is doing the same thing with, as a family, as a wife for her kids. Uh, yeah. And, and I'm excited for later on, we're going to 
talk more uh, more deeply about um, some things that you're putting together right now with regards to that. So when do you feel like you came out of this? I want to transition into another piece here, but about um, when were you starting to feel like I'm, I'm better now? If you can, you know, quote unquote better, like. Yeah. So, well, to be honest, um, last year, so in about, I, I, I was about six years not feeling well by mm-hmm. any means. And um, right when Dave actually t- got all the appointments for me, to see a therapist, to get my blood work done. Um, when I got my blood work done, a, a bunch of stuff came back and I was the, I'm not doing anything. I, I was the anti-everything and I will take the vitamin, the the the, her, the herbs, the, you know, I didn't want to do anything. And I, I did over five months, I played around with, I had some deficiencies, hormones. There was just things that were clear that I needed some help on. And I just played around and I finally, after about five months hit, um, you know, my concoction, I guess you could say that, that made me feel the best, but it took me five months of trying. Mm -hmm. Um, and it took me five months of being resistant to certain medications. So, you know, like a progesterone, I was like, no, 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 no. And I, I hit a point where I was like, I have to try something. So it took me about five months and then seeing my therapist and I saw her every week. And then I saw her every two weeks. And now I'm very proudly every four weeks. Um, but it took probably six months from that initial, let's see what everything looks like to, you know what? Oh my gosh. I remember one day waking up. I will never forget it because there was laundry at the end of my bed. I will never forget it. I, my alarm went off, my eyes opened. And I kind of like, I know not everybody does this because I still don't do it now, but it's mm. the first time that I, I kind of like went, oh, I'm going to get up. I'm going to do some laundry. Like I had, it, it was not me again. It was like a completely different experience. And I went, oh my gosh, is this what normal people feel like? And I couldn't believe it. I put laundry in. I got our kids lunches ready with, without struggling. It was just, I was up, I was moving and I, I couldn't believe it. And that little bit of oh my gosh, this is a completely different the taste, experience. The taste of it. The little taste. And again, it, I had to play around after that, you know, but just that taste was like, oh my gosh, I, I can, I, I, I want to do this. I want to get up. I want to hang out with my kids. I want to hang out with my husband. I want to go into the gym. I want to do all these things. Whereas before I saw everything was so difficult. My body was lead. My mind was fog. So every time mm-hmm. I thought of any action, it was just like, I just don't think I can do it. So, um, it took about six months. And then since then, it's been about a year of feeling better. Wow. And so fortunately, and again, I know the story, but um, fortunately, you were able to get yourself back, create this foundation, this scaffolding, right? Because you were dealt a bit of a curveball. Well, that's understating it. But at the end of the year, you had something else come up. At the end of the year of this year? Yeah, with, um, I believe something was going on with the family. Some... Oh, gosh. I'm like burying everything. I'm like, this yeah, was no. kind of significant. This is so significant. I saw I you totally a couple forgot. months after that and you were... Not well. Not well. But... Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I talk about, you know, things that really turn your mind sideways, totally this turning them off. what we talk about when we let go of the past and we live in the present. And so I think that as, as, as awkward as that was for a moment, <laughs> like it, that just, that's where you are today. And I, and, and so when you, when you express what was going on at that point, I think people might be shocked that you forgot. Um, but it's, it's a beautiful reminder that you, we don't have to hold on to these things and we right. can let go of them and just live in the today. And, and so, if you if you wouldn't yeah. mind sharing that, because I think, again, you got to a place where you were yourself again, and yes. you got some really difficult news. Yes. Yeah, so I was feeling well and reflecting. I'm so thankful how well I was feeling when I um, when I got this news. But um, my my family has been littered with cancer. Um, You know, a lot of my family members, grandparents and their brothers and sisters have had a lot of cancer. And I was always very concerned about my dad. 
um, just because I know it's prevalent in, in the Bay family. And um, I always worried about him and didn't worry about myself, right? It was really worried about him. And because um, my aunt had been diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer young, so she ended up getting herself tested for the BRCA gene and it came back positive, which means it's in our family. And the BRCA gene is just the breast cancer gene. It comes in a m- bunch of different um, forms. There's one, two, it's, th- it could be a variety, but it's, it's basically a gene mutation, which significantly increases the chance for cancer. And when I say significantly, I mean like 89% chance of breast cancer, oh. 50% chance of ovarian cancer based on the statistics of, of women who have had um, the a, a positive gene mutation for the BRCA gene. So my dad got tested and he was positive, which means my brother and I had to get tested because you have one copy of your mom's genes, one copy of your dad's. So both my brother and I had a 50-50 shot of having this BRCA gene, um, the mutation. And so my dad had let me know that. And I'm talking, I just knowing that was an option, I hadn't, you know, I hadn't had a mammogram because I'm not 40 yet. I wasn't even a didn't wasn't even a thought. Cancer wasn't a thought in my in my mind. And um, so he let me know that I had to go get tested. And if I had it, uh, that means I would be able to pass it on to my kids. It it goes as long as you have children. Mm-hmm. And so um, I did not take that news well, <laughs> to mm-hmm. be honest. Understandably, um, when there's something with your health that's an unknown. I would have rather just known, even if what, what I just needed to know. And, you know, it's things happen. And, and my husband and I had to go make sure all of our ducks were in a row because with insurance and there's just a bunch of things that you have to do to make sure you can't answer any questions. No, I don't have it if you knowingly do. And so oh, I had to good. do everything and make sure that I, I didn't know if I had it. So, so delaying your had, ability to actually know yes, you had to get. I had to delay and I couldn't get my test done until I got all my ducks in a row, which literally just as time went on, I, I just went deeper and deeper into the fact of, I mean, I, there was one point where I was like, pretty, I was certain I had cancer, not even the gene. I remember my doctor had said to me, have you had a mammogram? And I said, no. And she goes, well, you needed to get one yesterday. So immediately in my head, I, I just was like, oh my gosh, I have cancer. And um, it took four months for me to get those, those results. And the, the waiting was, was excruciating. You know, I was Googling double mastectomies and I was Googling, you know, what you would do for hormone therapy if you got your ovaries out at an early age. And I had no idea what was going on. And, um, you know, even from a financial situation, we're a small business and there was just a lot at play of the unknown. And I was not dealing with it very well albeit I was dealing with it much better than if I was, I was dealing with it as a normal person would waiting for results on your health. And so um, my brother ended up getting his results back first and he was negative. And I then went into overdrive. Oh yeah. Of being, now the odds are. Now the odds are it's me. Oh. Like the odds are you, you have one of two kids and yes, I know they both can have it. And yes, I know they both can't, but the odds were 50, 50, one will have it, one won't. And so I, as soon as he got the results back, I was like, it was, it was, I was certain I had it. And so I got my results back, um, got an email and I just showed my husband, Dave saying the results are back. Um, and literally I had Googled it so much. I had went through a company called color. Um, they're a science-based company and they're collecting, um, for research. And so I signed up for that. And, um, I knew exactly if I opened the email, I I had an opportunity to talk to a doctor or I could have just opened it on my own and I chose to open it on my own. But I know I had known that if there was a red bar on the top, that means I I had the mutation. And if there was a green bar on the top, that means I was clear. And I just put my computer down on the table and it was going through all these, you know, email, agree, agree, go into my account, agree, agree. I just needed to get through it. And, you know, Dave's over in the corner almost throwing up and I'm just like, I just need to know. And I clicked it and it was green and I stared at it and I just started bawling. Um, and I can sympathize with women who are positive because, um, or I can empathize, I guess I, you could say, I, I, I just, I, 
it's such a, it's just, it's really hard to, to not know what's going on. And then knowing that you just have situations, surgeries, however you would like to go about those, like going forward. Um, it's just, it's crazy. It's crazy. And it took me a while to like calm down. It took a while. Yeah. Well, and I can, I mean, think everybody can appreciate what we do when we have like a little rash on the inside of our arm. We Google this stuff incessantly, you know, and we have a resolution within that day or a couple of days later, like you're talking about stakes that are much greater and you have four months to just drive yourself crazy, trying to figure it out when you just need the results. And so, yeah. Um, it just ate away. But I clearly I forgot. And that was traumatic. I was traumatized. I mean, I was Googling everything from where to get my implants. You know, like I yeah. I was trying to find doctors, like the tattoo, the nipples on. Like I was, I mean, every, I was Googling everything. And honestly, I just needed to put everything away. But you it, can't. You just, you, you just I, I couldn't. What else is more important than trying to figure out if if you need to go that route? And yeah, and, and again, we, uh, our four couples spent um, the weekend together during that period. And, uh, you know, everybody was, no one, you don't know what to do in that situation because like part of you is like Peyton and I are are of the mind, like we don't want to, um, contribute to it, right. To the, like the fear, but we also have to appreciate that the fear is there. And so it's like, as a friend, I guess you just, you're just there. And if you want to talk about it, you talk about it. If you don't, then you don't, but it was, it was tough to watch you go through that and and not be able to do anything. You know, I can imagine, yeah. you know, what it was like for Dave to sit, you know, really on the sidelines and just have to be there. Yeah. And one thing Dave says all the time to me is if we're having rough days, you know, every once in a while, he'll be like, you know, just imagine what our days would be like if that came back differently. Um, and it really does put it into per- perspective. And that's the one thing, again, a lot of my family has had cancer and has passed away from cancer. And it's a, it's a real thing. And the whole not worrying about your health, and then you realize there might be something wrong with your health. You just see, you just see everything completely different because at that time I was even still trying to make my way back to softball. And I had I had told uh, my coach what was going on and they were the most, you know, Team Canada was the most supportive ever. But when it came, even when it was positive, or excuse me, even when it came back that I did not have the gene mutation, um, softball seemed so not important. And all I wanted to do is be with my my family. Well, in in perfect segue, because because you were able to get the, the, you know, you got the great kind of news softball became an option again. And now we're talking about going to the Olympics. So that softball is now a part of the Olympics again. And you were given an opportunity, an invitation, whatever, to possibly be on Team Canada. So you would be going as a 39-year-old mother of three to the Olympics, um, which is like, you, you hear that, you're like, oh, that's amazing. Like, yeah, you can totally go. Like, why wouldn't you go? But, you know, it, there are other people that are involved. And so walk us through what that process was like, because it's not just check the box. Of course I'm going. Right. It's not. Even um, though you may have thought that when you got the news. <laughs> I was definitely excited when I, I got the opportunity to go back and, and try and make my way as I have in the past. Um, but... As I mentioned uh, earlier in the podcast, the year before the Olympics is pretty intense, and it should be. It's it's what the whole that's everybody's purpose at that point. And so um, I, you know, got the opportunity, and because of everything that has happened, and because of that health scare, and because of the fact that I had overcome this depression, everything it screamed to me a little bit like, oh my gosh, I, I can't, like, I looked around, is this, is this real? I, I don't want to waste this opportunity, but I have a husband, I have three kids and a business. It's not easy, you know? And, and it is so true. Everyone's like, well, what do you mean you're not? Well, of course you got to go. Of course. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> it's a huge commitment. Yeah. And, and just so people who 
don't understand, this isn't like the dream team. They get together for a week before the Olympics and they go play. It's uh, lay out what the commitment looks like. Yeah. So the team actually gets together in the beginning of February and basically from February until the end of July, beginning of August are going to be together with sprinkled in, you know, fall meetings and and whatnot. Um, But it is, it's intense. It's six, seven months of being together almost all the time. And um, it is clearly different when you have a family and when you have a, a business and it isn't my highest value anymore. It used to be in 2004 and 2008. That was what I focused on. And part of the, part of the kind of weeding through playing and not playing, um, I do have a problem and I'm sure it's the athlete and the perfectionist, but you know, uh, our mental performance coach had said to me, she's like, Lauren, you, you want three pies. You want a pie for life. You want a pie for softball and you want a pie for your, um, sorry, your life slash family you want a pie for softball and you want a pie for your business. And she's like, but Lauren, you only get one pie in life. And you need to figure out if you will be okay having only one pie and knowing that you can't be 100% mom and wife and 100% business and 100% softball. She's like, you just can't. And so um, I had to be okay with doing what I could in all aspects of my life um, and balancing it out, um, and still kind of feeling good about it, feeling like a good mom and a good wife, feeling like a good business owner and feeling like a good teammate, because there are times that I have to miss workouts. There are times that I I miss, um, you know, being at my kids' games and there are times that I miss out on the business and I, I have to be okay with that. So I had to work through that. Um, but then I'll, like most importantly, you know, Dave and I had to work out how this was going to affect our relationship, our family. Um, and that was a very, very important um, discussion. And I think just a couple weeks of our lives, because I think we made huge strides. It did not necessarily, the conversations did not go wonderfully when we first talked about me playing again. Um, but what it allowed for was the most open, honest communication that we could have ever had. And I think we're in a better place because of that. Yeah. And what I love about it is that it started off the conversation, the discussion, really, really shitty and hard and uncomfortable. And a lot of times we just break away from that. We don't create this space like you both did to allow it to unfold and to start to see the truth in what the other was saying and what was actually happening rather than just, we, a lot of times we're protective of ourselves. And, you know, it was an amazing lesson for us as your friends, because we were all involved from the sidelines. We knew what was going on because you rely on, we rely on each other. And so just to watch the fear and the loneliness and the scared and, and all of that come up in the beginning and know that that's real and authentic and that's how we would all feel. And then letting go of that and, and just starting to see the truth and the, the entire experience that it's really an opportunity that you can't miss. And it's gonna be really hard you know, on Dave, it's gonna be hard when you, when you're not with the family, like there are all these things, it's it's hard, but the benefits, like what comes out of it is amazing. And you, you both just allowed the time and space for that to unfold and come to this point where you're both so excited about it and believe in it. And there's no resentment. Like if Dave just buttoned it up and pushed it down and said, I got it, I got this, we're good. Go, go have, you know, and, and, that just creates a division, right, within the relationship. And, and, and you, you both didn't let it go there, you know. And so it was awesome to watch you guys work through it and to get the text and the phone calls and just really just to see this arc of this thing. And it's like, holy shit, this had an amazing resolution. And so it was awesome. Yeah, and I, that, for, that, for that situation, um, I, I'm very proud of how we handled ourselves. And there were really tough conversations. And I'll be the first to say, 
Dave and I have worked on our relationship more than anyone I know, but I also don't know about anyone else's relationship. I just know that we work so, so, so hard on it. And we always have tough conversations and sometimes they suck, right? Like sometimes my feelings get hurt and his feelings get hurt and we say things that maybe we're trying to say it so the, the person it doesn't get hurt, but the message is hurtful. And, you know, you also want to vent because you're frustrated about something. And But those are the conversations that when they are settled, we feel so much better because I know where he's coming from. And I think in talking about whether or not trying to get to an another, another Olympics, knowing what the commitment's going to be and how I'm going to be away from the family and he's going to have a ton on his plate, he really just needed me to see it from his point of view. But that is the hardest thing to do because all I see it is from my point of view. And so it took a couple weeks, maybe a week and a half of talking, 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 talking. And it, it finally just hit a point where he just said to me, I just need you to listen to me. And I just need you to know that it's going to be hard. And I need you to acknowledge that. And what I was doing in this whole time is if he, if he had brought up something that was going to be really difficult, I had countered with the, well, you know, we can. And I was trying to make it positive. And so what that was doing was I, I didn't want to pile on a negative because then, you know, then we're going to start going negative. So I was trying to counter it, but he just didn't feel heard. If and he I, wasn't. And yeah. he wasn't. He was yeah. not hurt. He would say something that was going to be hard, and I would try and counter with how we'd be able to work around it. Yeah. And how many times have we all done that, right? And so, like, like, let's take note of this. It still doesn't work, okay? When we do that, it does not work. You, you are defeated each time you try that. Every time. And finally, he had just said to me, Lauren, you're not listening to me. I need you to listen to what I'm saying and I need you to acknowledge that it is going to be hard. And I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, it's going to be really hard. And he was like, well, this is the first time you ever said that. I was I was just afraid to pile on the negative. And once he felt heard, everything changed. And you, there's a fear, right? Like I had a fear that if I said you know negative things, then all of a sudden he would be like three times as negative and then it would just be for sure over. And it's, it's it's the whole looking at it from someone's perspective. And sometimes you don't need to fix it. I don't need to come up to a solution. I just have to say to him, yeah, that fucking sucks. Yeah. And it's like, I, I think a lot of times, right? I'll just speak from my own experience. I get worried about the outcome of the disagreement or whatever. So I'm trying to, like you were doing, right? Trying to figure out what's the best defense so that we can get to the outcome that I want rather than just shutting up and listening and having Peyton be heard. And it, it's, I mean, so many times when we get in these situations, right, we we just lock up and we don't, we, we don't want to stay in the fight. And we're just like, you know what, fuck it. We're just going to disagree. And we're not even listening to one another, right? We're telling a story about what the other person thinks and it becomes this convoluted idea in our head. And, and, and again, what you both did was an amazing lesson in what it means to stay in the shit. Because no one likes to be in the shit. Y'all didn't like being in it. But eventually, because Dave was able to articulate it in a way that you were able to receive it, everything just fell away. And it was like there were no more stories. It was just the truth of what was going on. And now this is where you are today with it. So it's amazing. So Yeah, no, you're right. I think staying in it, it's so so easy to go. You know what? You're right. Walk away and walk away. Oh. It's so easy to just be like, you know what? It's not worth it. I mean, I had six emails written up to my coach saying, thank you, but no, thank you. You know, literally I was like, not worth it. Hands up, not worth it. It was, I was a wall and, but I, you can't be a wall. You know, you have to kind of inner. <laughs> you can pay that bill eventually. Yes, exactly. And so, but that was, that, that was my initial reaction was like, you know what? Screw this. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I asked. Um, or I even brought it up and you just have to stay in it. The longer you stay in it, the more you figure out, the more you figure out, the better both parties feel. Yeah. Beautiful. So now with that in mind, right, soon to be three-time Olympian. And we touched on this a little bit earlier, but what's it like, right? Y'all have three kids. What's it like to, to have a mom who's a three time, soon to be three time Olympian and a dad who is one of the most athletic guys I've ever met. What's it like 
to, to grow up in your house as kids? Because <laughs> I think this is, I know the answer, but I freaking love it because the, y- y'all are as athletic and as talented and as accomplished as people I know outside of some pro hockey guys. But I, I, the way you parent is, 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 a, is a lesson to all of us. So please share. What's it like? I mean, our whole philosophy is just trying to get our kids to enjoy what they're doing and to allow them their own decisions. It's not my decision on what they want to do. I, I tell people all the time, if, if I go to a softball clinic, I'll tell them, I'll say, hey, when I was 12 years old, 12 years old I wanted to be a hairdresser in Trail BC. You have no idea what you want to do at 12. We we just want to encourage them to try as much as they can. And that's not just sports. You know, our daughter was in piano. They do coding club, like everything. Like you want to do chess club? Nerd. <laughs> Total nerd. Definitely. But we're just try it because who knows? Like who knows what you're going to like to do? And, um, you know, Dave and I are both very anti this all year round sports. Um, we're very, you know, we don't this season, we put our kids into more sports than we would like. And it was really just soccer, but it was more soccer than we should have. But, you know, they don't need to be running around when they're seven, eight, and 10 to 17 different practices a day, getting no sleep. Like we value sleep. We say, get off your butt and go climb. Like our kids climb trees and Mm -hmm. they're kids. And it's really important for us to instill in them that whatever they're going to want to do is because they're passionate about and so that's not for me to say. I mean, Grace told me, mom, I'm, I'm really so- sorry. I, I just don't like softball. And I said, that's great, honey. I, you love, I love that you love volleyball. That's your sport as, right now as, of, uh, as a 10-year-old. <laughs> I like that. Good catch. As of now. That's your um, sport that's your, as of right as now. As of now. Could yeah. change. <laughs> uh, but do you know how many parents say to me, oh my gosh, does that bother you? And I, I'm like, no, it's not. It's their lives. I want them to lead and live their lives. It has nothing to do with me or Dave. I played Division II hockey in college. People are still would give me like, oh, you boys aren't playing hockey? It's like, you know, they don't really like it. You know, it's like, and frankly, like, it's a lot of commitment. So if they don't really like it, there's no way in hell I'm going to get involved. Right, right. Well, and I think it's so easy to put what you think is right on the kids. And it's so easy to think, I love hockey or I love softball. So of course you're going to love it. I mean, she, when she said, I don't want to play it, I said, no kidding. I mean, it's so slow as a kid. I totally understand that. Like, what do you want to do? We'll try it. And so we really just want to foster a love of playing because like I said, even as I sit here at this moment, I'm 38, but I'll be 39 next year, trying to make my third Olympics, zero chance I would be here if I didn't love the sport. Zero. Not to be lost in the whole lesson here. Yeah, and, and, and so I wonder if... Are there some people out there that you have really appreciated, like some of the content they've put out? Like, is there a, are there some influencers out there that are putting out really good content for kids and raising kids in this way? Or is this just something that you and Dave have come up with because what feels right? I think both. Um, I think from our family background, I, I didn't grow up. I know me personally, I didn't grow up in a place where, um, I thought I was going to be, you know, a professional athlete. Mm -hmm. So that love of what I was doing just was instilled in me. And, um, but I I also think you look around and you see a lot of things that you don't want to do. It's almost like, you don't know, you don't know what to say, what you you don't know. It's hard to articulate what you want to do. You know what you don't want to do. You know exactly what you don't want (laughs) to do. And that for us has been a pretty driving force. I, I see kids, not happy to be places. And I know there's going to be, you know, off days where your kid's just kind of dragging that I'm talking practice after practice, after practice, after practice, just miserable to be there. And then the parent on the sideline screaming at their kid, right? Like you see things that you're like, I don't want to be like that. And so those are actually huge driving forces for Dave and I, like that doesn't feel good. And, um, but with that being said, uh, my husband and I love Michael Gervais and he is his, philosophy on sport. And the way he put it was, uh, he has a podcast called Finding Mastery. We'll link to that in the show notes. It's a, it's a fantastic show. He is a psychologist. He's, he's, he's fantastic. But his analogy is, 
you know, on the way to mastery. And that's if you're a kid, if you want to make it to the majors and you want to be one of the best of the best. Um, the goal is to stay on the train for 2000 stops. And right now kids are getting off at 200. Oh. They're getting off at 500. They don't realize you have to stay on. You got the whole, whole purpose is to stay on the train. You might not be the best, but it doesn't mean you're not going to be the best three years later. But kids, if they're not the best, they'll find a different sport when they're 10. And so his philosophy has really resonated with Dave and I, and we listen to a lot of his, a lot of his, uh, his stuff. And just being, I'm being very fortunate in, on Team Canada to have great mental performance coaches who also, when you strip away the end game, it's all about being present, getting better than you were yesterday. You can't control the person to your right. You can't control the person to your left. So there's no reason about worrying it. You know, there's no, no reason to worry about them. The only person you can control is yourself. And those that stay on the journey longer, and yes, you have to have athletic ability. You can't just, yes. you can't just, you know, if you, if you're not inclined to, you're not Michael Phelps and have that body composition, you know, if you're someone who's five, two, it's probably not going to be your sport. So of course you have to have the ability, but once you get the best of the best there, it's the kids and, and the adults that can stay on that train the longest. I think that's a, 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 and I thank you both for turning me on to Michael Gervais. He's great. And um, w one, uh, Peyton and I really enjoy Dr. Shafali Savari. Her stuff is is along the same lines. It's like, basically, you don't own these kids. They're not a reflection of you. Stop with the expectations. Let they are individual souls. Let them be who they're going to be and just, you know, support them in that, you know, and try to pay attention. And and again, if you're just, I, I want people out there to just check themselves when they're at their kid's sporting event. Like what kind of, like, is your kid looking over at you after every play? If he is, then you're completely fucking up. Like, and I've seen it on some of Jake's teams, every play down the floor, down and back, over to dad. And if dad's not there, over to mom to see what to do next. It's like, you, you the kid's not having fun. He's 14 and he's trying to figure out what to do to make mom and dad happy it's like that's a, about a big of a fumble as you can have and so i really appreciate where you and dave come from um with regards to raising your kids yeah it's it it's so important i had said this quote before but when you criticize your kids they don't stop loving you they stop loving themselves and there's a difference between between criticizing and guiding. You know, you don't want a kid walking up to a stove when it's on and, you know, obviously you're going to guide them. But if you let them be kids, you know, every time we have never, I shouldn't say we've never, we have made the mistake of asking about a game when they got in the car. We won't ever do it again. We say, where do you want to go for ice cream? What do you want for dinner? I love, like, I love watching you play. And all we get back is, thanks for coming to my game, mom. You know, and, and I don't care how they do. I just, did you have fun? Awesome. And it's so important for those kids to feel safe. And, you know, I learned that from my dad. My dad never sat in the stands. He always sat out in the outfield. He wanted to talk to nobody, say nothing. I would look at him. I'm, might, on, I'm on Dave's program yeah, He for might sure. give me the little, the little wave. So he acknowledged that he's watching, but it, it's just very like, this is your time to shine. You have a coach. You have any questions? Go ask your coach. I am here to support you and love you. And if you decide you want to play a different sport next season, great. I love that. And I, and I, and I want you to say that quote again, because it is you first time I'd ever heard it was last night and it kind of blew me away because it is, it, there's so much truth in that. And when, when, and when we, when, when the listeners out there start to unpack it, I think it will have a very big impact on how they relate to their kids. And so could you just share it with us one more time? Yeah. When you criticize your children, they don't stop loving you. They stop loving themselves. And it's exactly what you said when someone's looking over on the sideline. And it's, it's very important to have the kids have self-confidence. Like that's one thing we want to instill in our kids because confidence is everything, right? I've, I know what it's like to have no confidence. I know what it's like to have confidence. And I don't think we realize as parents the impact that we have 
on, you know, these little humans that we're raising. Yeah. And they need to know, all they need to know is that they're supported. That's really all, like all they need to know. The rest will figure itself out. Yeah. And that unconditional love. And, and, and do you know who the author of that quote is? And if not, we'll link to it in the show notes because it's a, when you said it both times, you said it, my whole body lit up. It's like, there's, there's so much truth in that. And anyway, I just, uh, I'm glad you shared that with us last night. And again, today. Yeah. Um, when so, you find who said that, let me know. <laughs> I will for sure. And so let's, let's shift gears into what you're working on now, um, besides obviously preparing for the Olympics, but, um, those of you who know Lauren and follow her on Instagram, like she's changed her name a couple of times, which uh, us in the know weren't in the know. We're like, what, where's the, how, where, how come it's not, doesn't say Lauren anymore. It says strong mom, strong family. And now it's back to, to Lauren regular. Um, but we had a, a, an amazing conversation about the direction of this two days ago at lunch. And I'd love for you to share what your vision is for this, your, I mean, di- please just share as much as you can because there's a lot in there. And I think it's so important for women to hear this, but also for men, because we can really um, l- overlay this onto our lives and see how it, it can impact us as well. So please share. Yeah, I am really into the whole idea of strong mom, strong family. So I bought the, I, or not bought, I, you know, got the Instagram handle, bought the website. I just, there's something that speaks to me and I think it's coming from everything that ever since I had kids, all of the ups and downs that I have had. And I, 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 there's just something about being a strong mom because there's a, almost like a definition out there, almost like an expectation, a societal expectation. Oh, you're a mom. You don't have your life anymore oh, you're a mom. You're the one that always gets left out. If someone's going to be left off a trip or you're going up a, um, say there's only a four person ski lift, you know, the mom's (laughs) always the one that's like, you know, you guys just go ahead or I'll be the one that sits back. Oh, deferring at all costs. Always. And putting ourselves on the the bottom of the totem pole. And on one hand, I, I totally get that. We do. We have a responsibility. That is by no mean what I'm saying. But I do believe that you can have part of you and still fulfill all of those obligations. But you have to you have to get that from strength. You have to invest in yourself. You have to take care of yourself. And that's physically, mentally, and emotionally because I say all the time, you can't give what you don't have. And if you are so depleted and you have no energy and you have nothing left to give, then your kids are going to be on the receiving end of that. Your family is going to be on, a, on the... Uh, receiving end of that. And so I I just think, I think it's almost like we as moms and parents have been lied to like, oh, well now you're a parent. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. You shouldn't have time. Oh, I totally, I totally get it. You don't have time mm. to work out. And there are seasons, right? Of course, there's going to be seasons in people's lives where maybe you go a few months of, it's been a couple months, but I'm talking, there's a difference between seasons and short periods of time and just years. Like I uh, I just don't think there's a reason 10 years should go by that you don't take care of yourself. And one of the questions I love to ask moms and and dads, uh, but parents in general is, hey, look exactly where you are right now. Look at how you are physically. Are you happy with the way you look? Look where you are mentally, emotionally, in your relationships, your marriage as a mom, and then put your kids there at that age and say, hey, this is exactly what your daughter's life is going to be like, or this is exactly what your son's life is going to be like. Is this a good spot for them? Would you be happy? And if there is a woman who is, you know, really overweight and she doesn't want to be, maybe she'll say, oh, you know, well, I, I hope my daughter, you know, takes care of herself. And the thing is, is when all of us as parents take this time off taking care of ourselves, because we're doing it for other people, all we're doing is setting the example that w- how we are right now is normal. And that's the example you're setting for your kids. And same thing in a marriage. Same thing, you know, if you are constantly fighting with your partner, it's not just about the way you look. It's about everything. Like, do you have friends? Do you have friendships? Um, there's so many things where if you look at your life and say, hey, this is exactly what I'm modeling to my kids. Mm-hmm. 
is this a life that I would be, that, that they would be happy with and I would be proud to have raised my kids to, to end up like. And I think it's, it's, uh, so let, let's, I want to be clear about the distinction too. Like you are modeling behavior for your kids. We all know that they pick up all of it. Now, again, this does not mean they're a reflection of you. They are going to learn from you, but they are their own individual, you know, uh, souls and, and people. And so, uh, don't get that twisted that just because they're not a reflection of you, like you can go do whatever the fuck you want with yourself and you won't have an impact on them. We have a huge impact on our kids. And so when you had said that at lunch, again, like in all the things that I've read and heard over the years, I'd never heard it put that way. And I thought it was just so simple to put your child in your shoes as a fill in the blank, however old you are, and is this the life you want for your kid? And if it is, then fucking a, yeah, you're good for you. Like you're le- you're you're setting a great example. And if it's not, and again, as your husband likes to say, Dave, everything's not binary. It doesn't mean you're either doing it or you're not doing it. Are there areas in my life that I want to set a better example for my kid so that when they get here, they are living this life. And so I think it's a great way for us to check in, right? In different areas, whatever the areas, the 10 areas of your life, like just do a little self-accounting, like how am I showing up? And as a, as an example for my kids. And so I love that, that that's the, the really the, the part of the genesis of, of what you're doing. And, and I also love that. I mean, and again, we've talked about this a number of times, but men and women, right? Married or not, we want to play the martyr role. You know what? I can do this. So-and-so has eight kids. They don't have any help. I've only got two. I shouldn't need help. Everybody's situation is different. You're bringing in help might free you up to actually be present for your kids when you're with them rather than just trying to manage and survive. And I think a lot of us, my hand up, I've felt that, you know, and I've never felt bad about bringing in help because I'm not bringing in the help to raise my kids and spend time and play with my kids. I'm bringing them in to do the things that I don't really want to do or Peyton doesn't really want to do. And they're happy to do it because they're paid and compensated for it. And when I'm with my kids, I get to do the shit I want to do. Yeah. I remember my mom had said to me, she's before I had ever had someone come and clean my house. Um, you know, she had said, Lauren, that's the time that you can spend with your kids. There is, there are situations that it makes so much sense, but you're right. Just because someone has that, just because it's right for one family doesn't mean it's right for another. You have to find your own, what works for you. And it, it is hard because you see what other people do and it's really hard not to compare, right? And it's like you said, well, they don't have any help. I mean, I have help. And then you start to feel bad about yourself and then you don't want it. And then you spend two years not having it. Then you finally get it and you think, well, why didn't I do this? For- <laughs> why didn't I do this earlier? All because, you know, you're stubborn. And I think, you know, we do grow up with an idea of how things are supposed to be. And mm-hmm. when it veers off of that, you think, oh gosh, I should, I, I should fix it maybe that wasn't the way your life was supposed to be. Yeah. And if you can explore, like, why not try and get a house? If you can afford and, ha- and are able to do that, try and get someone to clean your house for you. If you don't love having someone in your house, don't have them anymore, but you know the answer. And I think if we can just try different things that work for our families, it's okay if you drop your kids off for a play date and run and grab some errands and then you change and you're the one that has the play date. That supporting each other and actually having a community. I mean, that's the way we used to live. And yeah. I, and, yeah. Well, and, and, and you can drop off the kids and not go do errands. You can go have a cup of coffee by yourself and do nothing. You know, like, again, don't feel like we, I think a lot of times we feel that we need to fill up our our time with productive things, right? Yeah, but that coffee by yourself is probably one of the most productive things you People can do. People don't look at it that way, right? right? Like, oh, here I am. I'm just kind of fucking off at Starbucks for two hours while the kids, she's watching my kids. It's like, no, like this is your time to just be present and unwind and breathe. And so now when you go get the kids, 
right? You haven't been running around like a chicken with his head cut off. You can actually receive the kids in a loving way and you can be present for them. And yeah. so again, and you brought up a great point. Like we look at other people. So we see how they're living. We see one version of one part of their life, which is arguably not even the truth of what's going on, right? We make all these assumptions and judge ourselves against what works for you. And I love what you said, challenge your beliefs, challenge how you were brought up, like explore different ways to do things. And if it doesn't work, go back to something that did or keep working. You're not beholden to anything. Just because you hired someone to clean your house three days a week doesn't mean they can, you, know, you can just hire them to come one day a week or you can just try another option but a lot of times we're like, oh, I don't want to go down that road. You you have the the agency to do whatever you want. And so use it. Yeah. And things change, right? Like there, you might come from a household like I do. My parents, they, you know, had my brother when my mom was still a teenager and mm -hmm. they did, they scrapped Claude and did whatever they could to make it through. And that's been something that I have had to work on is I don't have to have the exact same life as my parents. I mean, it, the situation is different, but, and I, I think that what happens is we get stuck with what was in, in the past. And as long as we know, like for me, I just need to know it's okay if I do change my mind or it's okay if I do something maybe that is different than they would have done. But I think we just get really nervous too. And you have this idea of what you're supposed to be, but like, who's making that idea? It's awesome. Yeah, it's a great, I think that's a great lesson for everyone out there. It's something that I've been playing around with more recently. Like, it's so you reserve the right to change your mind, to just play. We don't know. We, there's a lot of stuff we don't know. And so just try to figure it out and explore. And so yeah. I love that. And, and, and okay, so I think a, a nice place to go when we're talking about strong mom, right? What do your girls' trips look like? What does it look like when you get together, you know, with Shannon and Peyton and Nicole and Kelly? And like, what are those experiences look like for you today? Oh, I love our girls' trips. Um, mm -hmm. You know, feeding and filling, feeding our souls, filling our cups, that is something we say all the time. And I think it's so easy to get caught in the rat race of life and wake up and do the same thing over and over and over. And I mean, I'll be the first to say all of a sudden six months will pass and you're in the same spot. Um, we do try and get together and we just honestly, yes, we're moms and yes, we have families. But at that point, I think we're just friends having a good time. Um, and it allows me to come back and just feel there, there's something, the friendship. And I think that's, so important. And when you, you know, as a parent, it's really hard because you are running all over places, but you have to literally make the time. The time isn't going to make itself for its friends. And so I just come back and it's just, you just feeds your soul. And then you're a happier person. Um, Dave actually makes fun of me because he's like, you need to see your friends even more. You know, yeah. I, I just, there's something about that community feel you don't get from anywhere. Uh, strangers is really nice, random acts of kindness. There's just something that your friends can give you that others can't. And so we do, we go on, you know, we'll pick a place and go over and I'll hang out and kind of just be like teenage girls again. We'll have sleepovers yeah. and it sounds ridiculous, but you know what? I never want to stop being a kid because what's, what's the fun in that? Yeah. And I love that. And in, in, in we obviously do a lot of couples trips together too. And there'll be periods where the, the guys will kind of get off in their little circle and the girls will, but but there's a lot of kind of intermingling of that. And um, what I've loved about it is just the intention behind these trips now. Um, there's, sure, there's some alcohol being, you know, uh, participating in, but at, essentially everybody's getting a really good night's sleep. Everyone's enjoying the time they're spending together and they want to be present for what's going on. Yeah, and well, to that point, we're talking about things like that you would never normally talk about. You know, it's really easy. We, of course, we still, I will, I don't talk about fashion because that's not definitely not my forte, but I listen. Um, but of course, we still talk about that. But we also talk about the real things that are going to help us 
through our lives. We talk about the fears that we have, or um, we talk about the things we've really been struggling with. And I can't describe how important it is to have a crew that you can say anything to. Um, and I, during my last six years of not feeling very well, there have been bits and pieces. I know I have, I have talked to Peyton a little bit. Um, there have been bits and pieces that I've been able to say, but even just those little things, um, it's so important to have somebody that you can fully open up to because you know, you're not judged. I know I can say anything in front of those girls and it might come out so wrong, but they'll just look at me and laugh and be like, I think you meant to say this mm. as opposed to when you don't know people, if it comes out wrong, then all of a sudden you're up at night thinking, oh my gosh, this, what do these people think about me? Um, there is just something so special about being able to fully be yourself. Um, and the goal is to be like that everywhere, mm. but it's hard being vulnerable. And so if you can at least start with that, uh, uh, a person, even one that you can fully just say, Hey, here are my battle wounds. Can you help me try and fix them? Mm, I love that. And I, I, it, it might be worth for people to hit the, the, the back button a couple of times to listen to what Lauren just said. It's about finding those people, finding your tribe, men, women combined, the whole thing where you can be you, you can be vulnerable, you can share all the shit that's inside you that you need to get out because if you don't, it's going to manifest in some pretty ugly ways. And so I, I, again, we're very fortunate. We've, We've done a lot of work to to get here, you know, but we have these different tribes that we're a part of where we can show up authentically as who we are and not be judged. Yeah. And honestly, that's probably the most important thing I think that's been said this whole podcast. It's taken a lot of work. Like, you know, people will even say about Dave, I have the best relationship with Dave. I mean, I adore him. And there have been people who are like, oh my gosh, I just want what you guys have. And I'm like, it takes work. It's not just going to happen. Same thing with your friendships. You know, yes. you go through ups and downs together. And sometimes, like you said, it's hard to like stay in, stay in it, but it really does take a lot of work. There has been a ton of self-reflection, a ton of really tough conversations on, you know, friends, Dave, it really does. It takes a lot of work. And I think there's this la la land feeling of like, oh, when you meet the right person or the right friends, it's just going to be. I married my best friend. Yeah. No offense. Fuck that one. All right? <laughs> right. That's like, I'm a huge seller of that. That's for all the traders out there. <laughs> but it's so, anyway, I don't want to get stuck on that. But um, I, I love, you know, one of the things about having, you know, the tribe and being able to show up. I think is that, um, well, I'll just say from my own experience, like when you communicate, like we have the four of us that are on a text chain and it's amazing, right? We, we stay connected. But what, what happened a couple of years ago is I was going through changes and I was trying to articulate them through a text change, uh, text chain. And a lot gets lost in that communication. And what happened was I was feeling like I was on an island and Dave, Greg, and Turts weren't understanding what I was going through. And, and they weren't, as it turns out, <laughs> you know? And, and, and it was, there was this uncomfortable, it wasn't a riff, but it was like, I didn't feel supported, loved in what I was doing. Cause I was feeling like I was making all these changes. Right. And I remember, um, you know, fortunately I'd become really close with Dave's brother, Mike regular. And I'm like, they don't fucking understand like what I'm going through or whatever. He's like, yeah, they don't. So explain it to them. I'm like, fuck, <laughs> you're so right. And so, and so we, you know, I was able to articulate in a much better way what I was going through. And then when we have our guys trip, it was like, boom, all the stuff that was, there was still some residual stuff that was going on that I had felt because again, there was a part of me that didn't feel loved and supported. I felt a bit judged and they're like, oh, 
no, dude, we, we were scared because we love you. And we know that, you know, sometimes people can take advantage of people who are open and, and loving. And so it's like, oh, so the story I was telling myself, it wasn't that. It was that I was being judged, not loved. It's like, just to your point with, with when Dave said, I just need to be heard, you know, it just flips everything, you know? And so I was, again, telling myself a story that wasn't true. And so don't make the mistake that I did and communicate solely through text when there's some important shit going on. So now when that happens, I pick up the phone and I call Dave and I call Turtz and I call Greg and they call me. And, and so now when it's important, like we're not left to our own interpretation. No. And that's why the trips are so important too. Yeah. Because things, yes, totally. And things do get lost through, through words. Uh, I do remember that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we all do. There's a lot of other shit going on too, which made them anyway, that's for another podcast, but anyway, thank you so much for coming yeah. on. You're amazing. Thanks for sharing all that you did and all the wisdom and all the lessons. And I love you. And I'm so grateful for you. Thank you for having me on. I love you too, Cal. <laughs>